Good morning, I'm Emma Walden and welcome to Fun Forum Live and our webinar today where we'll be looking at the immediate impacts of Britain voting to leave the EU and asking what asset management will look like in a post-Brexit world. We'll be emailing out a recording of our discussion today after the event and you can follow the conversation on Twitter at Fun Forum where you can also tweet any questions via hashtag FFWebinar. So the financial sector is facing a number of challenges and questions such as what will happen in terms of regulatory structures, access to the European single market, investment and trade. And I'm delighted to be joined this morning by two leading asset management experts who can share their insights with us today. Welcome Julie Patterson, Director of Investment Management, Regulatory Change at KPMG, and Jim McCorkin, CEO at Principal Global Investors. Thank you for joining us. So to begin our discussion, Jim, if I could start by asking you the most simple question, I guess, first, what do you think the economic impact of Brexit will be? Uh, thank you, Emma. <clears throat> simple question, but not really simple answer, I'm afraid. Um, Absolutely. I think, that, <laughs> I think that the impact of Brexit on the economy is likely to be somewhere between modestly negative and quite seriously negative compared with where the economy would have been on Remain. Uh, the reason I say that is we're already, first of all, seeing some impact on investment in the economy generally because of the uncertainty of the trade arrangements that will follow exit. Uh, we're also seeing some impairment of Europe-wide credit creation, and evidence of that is the plunge in bank stocks, even in Italy and Spain and France. So, you know, the bank stocks going down is evidence that credit creation will be impaired Partly this is a feedback loop with economic activity. And the real thing this will all depend on two and a half years out or whenever Brexit actually happens is what will the interaction between the single market and the UK be? So all eyes really will be on the negotiations when they start under the new UK government. If Britain re retains essentially fairly liquid access to the single market, then that's how you get to a very modest negative and then you pick up. If uh, Britain has impaired access to the single market with all that means, which seems quite possible given the British antipathy at the moment to uh, free movement of people, if that is limited access, then you could see a fairly serious economic impact both on the Eurozone uh, and on the UK. I think that is the reason why worldwide interest rates have come down quite sharply since the vote. It's because less economic activity means less demand for borrowing, which tends to take the price of money down. And that seems to me the most tangible impact in the near term. But we really have to watch the negotiations to see what the longer term impact will be. Indeed, an awful lot to be decided. Julie, increasing and in complex regulation has been a challenging is issue for asset managers over the past few years anyway. So how is Brexit now going to impact that? I mean, will it become an even more challenging environment in terms of regulation? Well, I think, to be frank, um, even had we not uh, been talking about Brexit, uh, regulation for this sector uh, is increasingly challenging. It's absolutely clear that there is, um, at global level, really, the debates, both post-crisis, the G20 commitments, but ongoing um, with the global organizations like OSCO and, and the Financial Stability Board, very much focusing on the sector. And uh, investment management regulators worldwide increasing their supervisory activity. Um, so uh, what we're seeing is a, is a convergence of regulatory priorities around the globe. That's not the same as saying the rules are exactly the same, but the kind of the regulatory imperatives underpinning them are. Um, and also, I suppose, just in terms of the UK, the, the FSCA has for a long time prided itself in being a sort of a global leader in regulation. And I can't easily see it wanting to um, move away from that sort of high watermark. So I think all these points, and as Jim critically says, what the exit agreement actually is, it, it doesn't point to um, a sea change um, in, in regulation of UK asset managers or indeed of um, asset managers within the EU. The focus, the focus on the sector will remain. So it's just the timeline, perhaps, that's the unknown. 
I, I think that's true. And, and I think it's an interesting one. I mean, we, we've heard a lot about, obviously, the Article 50 timeline um, or two years. Actually, Article 50 does allow that two years period to be extended, but we've had a number of European officials saying they want this over and done with as quickly as possible. That's an interesting comment, really, because trade agreements take a very long time. Uh, yes. They've recently um, announced that, that, that they've made significant progress close to agreeing the EU-Canada uh, trade agreement, and that's taken seven years. Um, so that's an interesting point. But I think we must, it's very important also to think about the, there's, an, a, there's a timeline post the actual exit, i.e. post-Brexit, um, yes. uh, for the UK. I mean, we have, we have to get, if we can, uh, and as Jim again says, depending on the exit agreement, we need to get so tick ups on what's called equivalence. That's not a single judgment. That's different criteria in, in every bit of legislation. So that takes some time. And, um, well, you know, and, and we've also got to rewrite our own law in the UK. The UK law is inextricably intertwined with European legislation. And in some places we don't actually have the rules because, it's, because they're in UK regulation with a capital R. So they sit there already. So the post-Brexit timeline is, is not insignificant. It's many years, I suggest. Absolutely. Now, now, Jim, you referred to it in your previous answer, but obviously the, the questions about the UK access to the European single market have to be uh, some of the, the most important at this point. And, and what impact do those questions have, if you like? What's the effect of there even being those questions? Well, I think that the um, access to the single market you can think of for our industry on two levels. One is the passporting and registration of funds and what's acceptable to sell around Europe. Uh, I think people focus a lot on that, particularly because of the new rules on international hedge funds, the rules on domicile and activities you have to have within the EU. But I would point to you know, we're, we're in the industry always very negative about regulation. I'd point to USITS as a regulatory environment that has in some ways been very successful and actually become the global passport for mutual funds. You know, we, uh, we offer our USITS funds around the world, and although we're a U.S.-based manager, it's USITS that we're selling in a lot of the countries we're uh, operational in, in South America and Asia, for example. And uh, I would hope that USITS does not get impaired as the global passport. Uh, very important there is tax withholding. You know, we talk a lot about regulation, but I actually think what happens on tax arrangements is going to be just as important. A lot of the global success of USITS has been the benign tax treatment that's been available in Luxembourg and Dublin with the absence of withholding taxes. I think we need to watch what happens there. It would be nice for the industry if there was a little more abolition of those withholding taxes so third country nationals uh, could invest. But, you know, I don't think that's going to happen in a lot of places. I think that's why, for example, international investors don't buy U.S. mutual funds or indeed U.K. domiciled ones. So I think to Julie's point about regulation, you've also got to think about how the, the tax framework um, plays out in a post-Brexit world. And... Uh, you know, attitudes will be changing. Um, Britain has been the the push of uh, the, the country responsible for a push towards free trade in the EU. If that's not there, then that makes quite a negative uh, impact. I've talked with German and French asset managers uh, since the vote, and one of their big apprehensions is Lord Hill stepping down from the Commission, a new commissioner responsible for the asset management sector. Um, that uh, could lead to a change of regulatory attitude away from the British sort of free trade approach. I'd also, to underline Julie's point about convergence in regulation, you know, a very interesting thing we've been watching is the rules on liquidity in funds. The SEC in the US published their rules last December, uh, or the draft rules about liquidity of mutual funds of an underlying assets. The interesting thing to me was they published that the week that Third Avenue Fund closed and uh, gated. I think that that was, in a way, a, sense, a piece of luck for the SEC. But I think we're going to see in Europe some sort of regulatory act reaction to the closure of the UK property funds. I think that sort of uh, closure, not allowing uh, investors to withdraw, not being able to, 
tends to have a regulatory impact. So I'd be watching that. And I think Julie makes an important point about the convergence of regulation. Regulation is in many ways a political reaction to the problems investors investors uh, um, encounter. So I think uh, there's a lot of pieces to this. But from the asset management industry's point of view, it's not just about slowing growth, lower rates. It's also about how the different structures are acceptable or not to clients in Europe and around the world. Uh, Going back to that point, Julie, I mean, from what Jim was saying there is is the irony that actually regulation could help provide stability with things like USITS. Could it it be a stabilizing force in the face of sort of big political or social change? Well, I think it is certainly true to say that the post-crisis EU legislation. I mean, one can argue that there is maybe too much of it. One can reasonably argue um, that there are places, because it was sort of done in bits, that there is duplication, um, particularly in reporting, a considerable burden. And what's interesting, though, of course, under Commissioner Hill, that was something that was very much at the top of the pile to be looked at to um, try to sort of rationalise um, some of the post-crisis regulation, but but the the fact of it, I mean, it is it is clear it has created some stability. For example, in the banking network, better capitalised banks around Europe, and uh, recovery and re- resolution arrangements. You know, still some way to go, but but the, but the point is, is there and clearing and settlement infrastructures. Again, some 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 remaining questions, but still uh, a significantly better place probably than pre the crisis. But I suppose just kind of building on. Um, Come to Jim's points, and there's one, one way of looking at it is, is the UK trying to look into Europe when it's come out, and and for the investment management sector, um, and Jim touched on this, it, it, the answer it's not a simple answer. Clearly, clearly, it will matter what the exit agreement is, but but within this sector, we have to think both about where the fund is, we have to think about um, where the management company of that fund is, but also where the investment management is done. And um, you, you have different answers to those three things, and you get even more different answers if, depending on what assets you're invested in and what clients you've got. So it's it's really you know the question for the UK managers, but also for the remaining European asset managers, what what does this look like for the UK to be a third country? It's not um, a one-dimensional answer. It's a, it's it's more than a Rubik's cube, actually. Absolutely. It's six-dimensional. And I suppose yeah. from a European point of view, yeah. just thinking, um, you know, the priority there, very much under this banner called Capital Markets Union, the fact that there are there is too little cross-border flows um, of retail consumer money, and that too much of savings is held in cash. So the Capital Markets Union (CMU) was meant to address that. Uh, alongside just generally encouraging more private investment to replace constrained bank and constrained government lending. And so the key question for the Europeans is then, what would that look like when the UK is not in it? The UK, of course, would have been a key component in this initiative. Um, will it still survive? I think, I think it probably will in some way. Uh, if nothing else, for example, the Commission is determined to tackle remaining barriers to use its uh, cross-border distribution within the EU. Um, but there, the UK, to be frank, USITs are EU domiciled products with EU domiciled management companies. So the, the, the vast majority of UK USITs can no longer be USITs. Um, that, that's quite a big change in the landscape. Yep. So we're starting to see some questions coming in from people uh, tuning in today. Uh, first, first question What's the smart play? I guess that's a question similar to the first that I asked you, Jim. But seek the certainty offered by a new EU-regulated subsidiary or wait for an equivalence determination? Um, I think it's a bit more, even more complicated than that. And, you know, Julie's point about the domicile of the fund, the domicile of the management company, and then where the investment management is actually done, there are endless permutations of that. You know, we find ourselves offering funds which are domiciled in Dublin to people in Brazil or Japan, uh, where the client is, uh, with the advisor being London-based and the um, investment management getting done in the United States. Um, What's the weak link in that? It may well be the London-based management company two or three years out. Uh, As a global manager, 
some of those activities may need to be done within the EU to re- to, to retain use at status. That kind of needs very careful, very careful look. You know, as a global manager, we we have biggest European uh, domicile by far is London, but we may need to expand what we do in Amsterdam and Munich if we're going to uh, retain that use of structure, Amsterdam, Munich and Dublin, which is where we do things in the EU as it will remain. And I would think every global manager is facing this question. And uh, I don't at the moment yet know whether you're going to see um, management companies that are currently in London needing to um, needing to be redomiciled within the EU to keep the use of status. That would be a fear. But um, I, I think that one just needs to keep one's options available um, and to be uh, established in other EU countries may turn out to be quite important depending on how the rules get written. Yeah, and this leads quite nicely on to another question that's been submitted, saying the £13.6 billion pound Swiss fund manager Unigestion has honoured a pledge to keep London as its second home in Europe, uh, regardless of the vote. Um, they're looking to double headcount in London over the next 18 months, it says. So do you feel uh, other managers will follow suit uh, once there is more clarity or will they move to balance away from London prior to the actual exit, if you like? So there is some evidence of, of positivity out yeah. there, perhaps. There is. There is some evidence of positivity. To me, the really key issue near term will be what the... Um, incoming government actually does and when it resolves it about EU people working in London. Um, You know, I'm told, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, but the new Prime Minister seems to be reluctant to make any promises on this. There's a risk that the status of EU citizens working in London is a bit of a bargaining um, counter relative to UK citizens living in Europe. Any uncertainty on that is pretty bad for the industry because the industry is a very global one. Lots of skills, lots of cultures, lots of languages. And uh, London will be very dependent on keeping that aspect in the future for its ongoing strength. I think it's too early to call whether global managers like us will increase or decrease their capabilities in London on a three to five year view. You know, I really go back to how do the, how do the rules shake out and how do the, the negotiations shake out. Absolutely. You talked there about the sort of the global nature of, of the industry. Um, so looking at markets around the world, what, what effects are we seeing of Brexit? And are there any safe havens out there at the moment? Well, I, I, I think that the, the kind of obvious safe havens since the uh, vote have been uh, the dollar, the yen and uh, high quality bonds, particularly government bonds. You've seen you know, a very tangible reaction to the vote in terms of uh, U.S. government bond yields. Um, And given that the U.K. is 5% of the world economy, uh, that is actually quite remarkable uh, when you look at the scale and liquidity of the U.S. capital markets. I think it's this point that fear or concern or a belief that this will cause continued deflationary conditions is leading to low and in many cases negative government bond yields. And, you know, I think that's going to continue to be one of the the big things economically that will shape what this industry does and can do. And, that you know, you're talking about the big big players there. What about emerging markets? What effect is it having out there? Well, it's interesting. Since the vote, the emerging market currencies have actually picked up. Um, I think that that's a brave sort of view that free trade will be unimpaired because the emerging markets are very dependent on trade. That's how they've been able to take hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last two or three decades is by, um, is by investment to back trade. And um, if, you know, if the EU manages to get through this with not only UK access to the single market, but European activity in the UK unimpaired, then uh, that might be the right reaction. But if you saw glitches in the negotiations and if you saw a negative impact on trade, uh, that could be very bad for emerging markets. I think also one of the reasons why emerging markets have done quite well 
is perceptions that the U.S. presidential election will not go against trade, uh, by which I mean in the polls and for most pundits, it looks like Mrs. Clinton will be the next president. The, the emerging markets regard that positively because she's been at least somewhat pro-trade uh, in, in her past stances. Uh, Mr. Trump as president would be much less uh, conducive to trade from all he said. So I think you have to, I think you could see a similar sort of thing going on in the US presidential election to what you saw in the Brexit vote. In the run-up, the relatively benign economic outlook is expected. And I'm talking here technically, economically, rather than any political sense. Um, yeah. But who knows what happens when the vote comes? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you talked there about the US. I mean, with an election just months away, asset managers will be, will be looking at the global situation and not just Brexit, because there's uh, plenty on the horizon, shall we say. Yes, no, that's true. And... You know, that's why I come out of this thinking one of the very clear impacts here is that Brexit leads to the likelihood of continued very low interest rates. And as we all know, that's very inconvenient and very difficult for retirement plan investors, for insurance companies, for anyone who needs a yield. Julie, do you see um, effects with concerns across Europe from other countries as well and how that might impact the industry? Because obviously the UK has taken this decision and we've seen other sort of populist movements uh, globally on the rise. Do you think this will have an impact across Europe, obviously, with the sort of destabilising uh, sort of effect it has? Well, I think I'm... As a, a regular Brussels um, journeyer, I'm seeing certainly nervousness on that regard. But also, on the other hand, I, 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 you know, maybe ironically, a determination to stick together. So in one sense, um, and as Jim alluded to uh, earlier in his comments, the, the fact of the UK coming out almost uh, pushes some of the other countries to down a road of greater convergence themselves, um, uh, particularly in the eurozone. So that, you know that it, it really raises questions about the whole shape of Europe and what it looks like. Um, is there a core and periphery, or is it it's still one with all being equal, as it were? So I think that's certainly there, and I think just um, also uh, picking up. Obviously, we, we've commented quite a bit on the. Um, sort of regulatory issues and, and you know the tax considerations and I, and I think you know as a general thing I'd say you know wait do the analysis of um, what you've got where and 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 all these different dimensions but as a general matter maybe don't jump too quickly but on the other hand the critical question is what what do the if you've got some big investors as asset managers uh, taking a different view of you doing stuff in the UK then irrespective of what the regulatory and legal position may be, um, some firms may just be, you know, find themselves forced to uh, make changes to satisfy big investors. Yeah. And, of course, the other, the other interesting question is what happens to the, the, the Europe's primary capital market, which is in the UK? Um, yeah. And, you know, Indeed, I mean, it's, it's not just the buy side here, it's the sell side. You know, if the sell side yeah. start to move and have dual hubs, what, what happens? How, how, do, how do we deal with that? So there, there is an awful lot of, there is, you know, almost in every direction you look, there is uncertainty. But I, th I think the key things for firms to do is, is just do that analysis of what they've got where, who their clients are, what the assets are, and, and always do that regulatory analysis so that they are ready to move um, when either the time is right because we know what exit strategy is or, or just when, the big investors say, excuse me, guys, we want you to do something rather differently. Do you think those plans were truly in place for a lot of firms? Because I think Brexit shocked everyone, uh, really. And, uh, you know, whether firms were actually ready and, and ha had got the correct amount of planning in place. Well, certainly some firms have taken uh, and made some immediate announcements about their funds. You know, it comes back to this, the fact that this is a multidimensional question, where your funds are, particularly you sits, uh, as opposed to where your investment manager is. And what, what, what we've seen is stuff on, on funds, some announcements about some major 
UK-based um, asset managers uh, extending or setting up fund ranges in uh, Luxembourg or Ireland. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I suppose the, I think the, inter- the other interesting question here we haven't touched at the moment is, is the attitude of the regulators in Europe. It's, it's a very interesting thing because in one sense, the, the FCA is the most experienced investment management regulator. You know, I mean, certainly, you know, Jeremy's Bath in and, and the French and, and so on, Dutch and Italian, number, you know, have expertise in this area. But it is in the UK that you really do see the standalone large investment management houses. And even those that are owned by banks and insurance companies very much operate independently. On the continent, it's quite a different picture the large uh, the asset managers are really predominantly owned by banks, and the regulators um, think of them pretty much as asset management as being an activity, one of a number of sort of banking activities. So, so the mindset is very different, and and so when people are, are looking at different domiciles, it's not you know they not only think about their investors, yep. but but actually what what's the regulatory uh, attitude there look like it is another dimension that firms just need yep. to think about. Yeah, you yeah, touched that. Uh, I think this. Sorry, Emma, if I could just comment on Julie's ahead, point, yeah, there's some you. very important. There's some very important points in there. Uh, the capital markets are located in London. That's where the wholesale capital markets for Europe overwhelmingly are. If the e- the rest of the e- remaining EU cut themselves off from the capital markets by isolating Britain, that would cause serious damage to their own economies through the reduction of uh, of credit flows. That could be that is something to watch out for. If there's too much political vindictiveness here, then you're going to see some serious economic damage. Whereas if this sails through and they continue using the London Financial Centre uh, and London capital markets, then that's my not much damage scenario. So just to conclude and, and round up, if you like, coming off that point, Jim, what would you say that asset ma- managers should be looking out for next and doing at this moment? And Julie, I'll ask you the same question too. I think to be very watchful on uh, particularly where your people can be in order both of residency, which I hope gets solved soon, and in terms of the residency or domicile of the different activities um, Julie described. You know, many of us have used its funds with management companies in London I think we need to be very vigilant as to what that uh, actually will look like looking forward and whether we need to be more active in, the, in, in global asset managers in having management companies domiciled in other parts of the EU. So I think there are questions here which depend ultimately on how the regulators as well as the political negotiators work. But I think at the moment it's a time for contingency plans rather than big changes of direction. I, I, I think Tim's absolutely right. It's contingency plans. And, and, and I would just, um, I think the key thing is for firms, particularly asset managers, to think, try to, to map every one of these dimensions. So the fund, the management company, the investment manager, which assets are we talking about? Because different legislation uh, impacts securities, say, in uh, funds with der- money market funds derivatives than it does private equity or that it, than it does real estate. Um, think about critically where your investors are. Um, and what type they are. Are they retail professional or are, are they non-EU or not? And, 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 but also think about who you're placing deals with. So, you know, you've got to mismanage which brokers are you using and where they are. And, you know, you've got to go and custody services for your funds. You, you need to think around that full range of dimensions plus which regulators. Uh, and as Jim mentioned earlier, then you've got the, the tax issues. That's a, that's a big mapping exercise, I think, is the key issue to do now. Um, and, you know, and even if Brexit is more than two years away, it's absolutely essential to do that mapping now, um, if nothing else, so that you can reassure your, you know, your significant clients um, that you have thought through all the dimensions and that you have um, you know, optionality to deal with different outcomes. Brilliant. So think about your plan, your people and your partners and uh, make that mapping process as as sort of uh, complete and entire as you can. Yeah. yeah. And and I think the people side um, 
I mean, it, it, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, that there has to be people are so critical in this that they have to be part of a negotiation. So in one sense, um, uh, you can see how the UK politicians, and I'm, I don't usually excuse UK politicians, but I can see how they're caught between a rock and a hard place because they're wanting to reassure people who are doing valid, valid jobs here in the UK and to reassure um, UK nationals who are working in the EU. But at the same time, you don't usually you know, give up stuff when you've already before you go into the negotiation. And, and I think the key issue firms is this. Um, it isn't, you know, if the worst comes to worst and we have no free movement at all, uh, that does not mean that you can't have EU non-UK nationals working here or vice versa. I'm afraid it does mean it's more administration in the terms of arranging visas. But yep. that's doable. It's known territory, uh, particularly, yep. you know, because the larger global players are doing it for, uh, for like US, they're doing it for the US, they're doing it for yep. Australia exactly. and so on. So it is known territory. It's just a more administrative cost. That's the point. But, uh, but I, th I think the, the core thing about reassuring uh, your own workforce is absolutely essential. Interesting times ahead for all. That's all we have time for today, though. Thank you so much to our panellists, Julie Patterson and Jim McCorkin. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to those of you who took part, sending in questions today. A reminder that we will be emailing out a recording of our discussion today for you to refer back to. And there's plenty more Brexit commentary available at www.funforumlive.com and on our YouTube channel, Fun Forum TV, where you can access lots more video insights and expert interviews. We look forward to seeing you at our next event, Fun Forum Africa, taking place in London from the 14th to the 16th of September. And you can tweet us or visit funforumlive.com for more inf information about that too. But for now, from me, Emma Walden, and all the team at Fun Forum Live, have a very good afternoon.